Thank you. tape over all these logos so that we're not advertising? Yeah, no, actually, no, actually, leave them out there so then I can go hunt them down and get some support. There you go. What? Isn't that cool? It coincides. Powered by Starbucks. <laughs> Only get the real camera. I like your idea, Harry, actually. I'm going to let you ask the first question. What's up, man? unlike anything I've ever seen, certainly. I think that uh, people in your line of work will be studying this in, in, in poli-sci schools for, for years to come. Uh, you know, one thing that we're seeing is certainly an unusual presidential campaign, particularly from the candidate on my side of the aisle, uh, who has broken a lot of the rules but continues to uh, uh, continues to, to do reasonably well in the polls despite that. Uh, you know, I would have not advised him to do many of the things he's done. Uh, but in many states like Ohio, you see him uh, uh, within a margin of, of, you know, within striking distance anyway of a majority. Uh, certainly, I think that, that one of the, the, the interesting stories here in Ohio is something that maybe we've never seen before, and this is sort of this reverse coattails idea. Uh, you, you've seen a nearly flawless campaign from Rob Portman, who I think is just a, an outstanding statesman. I, I'm a big fan. Uh, and I think would would, would you know be a, a real shame if Ohio didn't reelect him. But that notwithstanding, just from the tactical standpoint, he's run a very good campaign, and his team has made use of data and volunteers and traditional media and earned media and and new media in in all kinds of uh, new and creative ways. And what you may be seeing is something that I don't think we've ever seen before, where a down ticket candidate could be carrying the presidential campaign. It's remarkable. We are heading into. I think debates are primarily entertainment. I think that it's uh, particularly in the primary cycle, it's a really shabby way to select a candidate. Uh, people need to do their own research, spend some time uh, researching the background of these candidates, their policy proposals, and that kind of thing, instead of trying to think that I can sit down for two hours of primetime network television and, and make my mind up. Uh, what you end up seeing in a debate um, is a, uh, a contest of gotcha, one-liners, uh, that kind of thing that, that in many ways is actually kind of beneath the dignity of the office, I think. Um, but, you know, it's where we've got to. It's kind of reality TV. Now, 
Will I watch? You bet it. Uh, you know, you bet I'll watch. It's interesting. Uh, it will make news. It can change the uh, the course of an election. Um, you know, and this is not anything new in, in history. The old, uh, the example everybody goes to is the Kennedy-Nixon debate uh, where John Kennedy looked like this young, handsome, energetic guy and Nixon uh, looked like this sweaty, nervous uh, uh, guy because of the, the, the one used makeup and, and didn't, and one didn't use makeup. And when you're on television under the lights, if you don't have makeup on, uh, no matter how manly you think you are, you're going to look shabby without the makeup on. And so, you know, the, the debates are, are entertainment. Um, they uh, can give you an insight on the candidate. Uh, but please understand that all of these candidates rehearse and practice, and they have a pocket full of one-liners that they're ready to unleash in these sort of gotcha moments. It's uh, it's more entertainment than it is a real thoughtful way of picking a, a candidate that's important. Well, we don't have to worry about how a candidate with a young uh, No, uh, and, and that's a remarkable <laughs> thing, too. I mean, you know, we've got 69- and a 70-year-old candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's unusual. First of all, it's a huge undertaking, and uh, a huge shout-out goes to the people that run our elections. Uh, it's a lot of hard work. They get there at 6 o'clock in the morning, maybe earlier, set up all these voting machines. They're there until well past 7.30 at night when they tear it all down, and then they have to take it back to the Board of Elections. Um, a lot of groups take it for granted when they show up at the voting location that it just sort of happens, but there's people behind the scenes that do all this work. Uh, the good news about our elections, in a lot of ways, is how decentralized they are. Uh, now, people talk about the election being rigged uh, or someone hacking the election. A lot of that's pretty irresponsible talk, I believe, actually. Uh, and we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't really be entertaining that kind of conspiracy theory stuff unless we have a good reason to believe that there's a, a shred of, of truth to it, and there really isn't. Uh, the, the decentralized nature of the elections mean that there isn't one national election. There's not even 50 state elections. There are hundreds and hundreds of local county-run elections. In Summit County, our Summit County Board of Elections runs the show. Uh, in our neighbor to the west, uh, in Medina County, the Medina County Board of Elections runs it. And same for the other 88 counties in the state. And so in order to perpetrate any kind of massive fraud, you would have to convince hundreds of elections officials in hundreds of locations around the state to become felons, and that's unlikely to, to happen. At least uh, you would be exposed for, for doing so. Now, sometimes election fraud happens, but it's extremely rare, and when it does happen, we need to, we need to you know, prosecute it and make sure folks go to jail for it because it's a very serious matter. Uh, but the way that elections run in the state of Ohio and in the United States of America is the, the model for the rest of the world. It truly is. But the moon landing is fake, right? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Anyways, uh, Ohio obviously has been at the epicenter <coughs> uh, of our elections since uh, the early part of the century, uh, even before maybe, but certainly 2004, 2008, 2012, yep. not a more important state in the country. Uh, so far this year, we've, we've tracked some uh, of the uh, candidate travel uh, at the Bush Institute, and Ohio, again, leads uh, the nation in terms of candidates actually traveling uh, you know, to this particular state. Do you expect that to continue? We see the polls are starting to shift. Uh, right now, Trump is, has a slight lead. Uh, do you see that uh, starting to shift as the polls start to tighten in other places like Virginia uh, and Colorado, which seemed uh, uh, you know, out of reach for the Trump campaign? Uh, now it seems within reach. Do you expect uh, Ohio to still uh, be uh, at the number one spot? Yeah, I think we will be. I mean, the fact is Ohio picks presidents, and that goes back decades. Um, Ohio picks presidents because we are a large and diverse state that is in many ways a microcosm of the nation. Uh, if you look at Ohio, we've got great urban areas. We've got great rural areas that feed the world. Uh, we've got urban areas that provide uh, the, the, the manufacturing uh, backbone that, that makes our country great. And, uh, and so, so many different things, so many different ethnic groups in Ohio. Uh, the southern part of the state is very different from the northern part of the state, even traditionally how they were settled, one from New England and one from the south. Uh, and so Ohio is a state uh, that gives you a sort of a snapshot of the country, and we're pretty evenly divided. 
Uh, so we'll continue to maintain our role as the swing state, as the deciding state in, in, in the elections. Uh, also because Ohioans, I think, uh, have uh, um, a very serious approach to, to the way they uh, pick their presidential candidates. I think that Ohioans are savvy. Uh, we've been the subject of so much campaigning. If you live in Ohio for very long, you have been bombarded with television ads and your mailbox stuffed full of things and your social media feed with all kinds of ads from every candidate. And so Ohioans have developed a pretty good BS filter uh, and have learned how to sort through the stuff, right, uh, and become savvy uh, consumers of political information, and, and I think that that'll continue. Now, as the as the race tightens, it almost inevitably does in a presidential election. Uh, those candidates will have to make logistical decisions about where they spend their time. Ohio will not lose its prominence, but we will share that spotlight with other states. How has technology, technological innovation, affected the political process? Yeah, uh, it, profoundly, but it also can be overstated sometimes. What still matters more than anything is a candidate and his or her message getting through to voters who make a decision that that person's the right person for the job. So some people focus on the platform or the technology and lose sight of the message, and that's a mistake. Um, the social media matter? Absolutely. Uh, new media? Absolutely. Traditional media still matters too. But what's more important than the platform or the means of delivery is the message the candidate has and how well they connect with voters and how well they inspire voters to believe that they're the right person for the job. I've always said that campaigns are job interviews. It's the most complex, grandiose job interview in the world, running for the American presidency, but it's a job interview. And uh, millions of Americans are, are interviewing candidates and deciding who they want to hire for this most complex job in the world. Uh, the, way that we, the way that we conduct those interviews change over time, uh, but the essence of it doesn't. You know, in a lot of ways, it's an in, in, internal matter. I'm not part of this campaign, which is sort of rare for me, because going back to 04, I've been part of every presidential campaign, and so it's kind of a bizarre experience sitting this one out. Uh, but I'm just sitting the presidential campaign out. I'm actively involved in, in other campaigns locally and, and that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, Kellyanne Conway, who's the current campaign manager, will probably stick around through the end. Um, it's very disruptive to change campaign managers. It also creates a sense of um, disruptiveness or, or, or disorganized uh, uh, nature for a campaign. So I don't, I don't think you'll see another, another change for them. But you know, part of this is the kind of uh, irreverent and um, unconventional nature of this candidate, um, right? What is the guy famous for? Telling people you fired. And so uh, he's, he's done the same uh, with his campaign staff. And uh, you know, in some ways, that's part of. Part of his appeal is he's a no-nonsense candidate. He's a guy that, that people, uh, some people identify with because he's a hard-nosed, you know, East Coast guy that tells people get out of here if they're not getting the job done or whatever. That, uh, you know, I, I also think that uh, uh, that that's some of the things that some people find concerning about the guy. So, uh, you know, it, it's indicative of the the personality of the candidate. It always is that way. You can you can wrap a campaign in all kinds of fancy clothing, uh, but at the end of the day, the campaign and the staff and the media effort and everything around the campaign is a reflection of that candidate. It, it genuinely works that way. Yeah. Anybody who serves in the state senate and sits here and tells you that they want to run for president should never be eligible for it because they have an ego uh, of immense size. And that's something that, you know, who knows where, where life takes you. I think anybody in this room, if they're ever given the opportunity to run for the presidency of the United States, should take it because it's a immense challenge and a chance to serve your country in a really profound way. Um, would I consider it? Yeah. So would you, I hope, right? Like, you know, so, it, but is it in my imminent future? Absolutely not. Um, what I want to focus on is, is the work I have to do as a member of the state senate in Ohio. Uh, and then when I'm term limited in 2018, I want to look for another opportunity to serve uh, if that uh, presents itself. Of course, State Senator Barack Obama uh, from Illinois was taking <laughs> presidency back then, so it's not unheard of. He may have been. <laughs>
Yeah, so every candidate has their own kind of gut about what works. There's some empirical data out there that shows you what works, but the fact is that the more um, uh, the more disruptive something is, the more it works. Like the, the more it gets in your face, the more it works. So television works really well because when you're watching a show and that commercial comes up, you kind of can't avoid it. You can flip through channels or whatever else. Uh, you know, social media works because it's put right in front of you. Um, does mail work? A lot of people argue it really does, but um, it's got to get somebody's attention. And the old saying is, how long does somebody spend reading your mail piece? As long as it takes to walk to the trash can. So it depends how long their driveway is, right? So if somebody has a long driveway, they're, they're maybe going to actually read the whole mail piece you send out. But if somebody has a short driveway, it's going straight in the trash. It's, it, I mean, that's kind of the, the mentality of it. But one thing that has always worked and will always work is direct contact. When a candidate knocks on your door and says, I'm running for office, I hope you'll consider me, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, it's pretty impactful, I think. And unless the kids are crying and the dinner's burning and the, you know, like unless life's happening and you just don't have time for it, most people want to engage. They want to, okay, tell me what's on your, tell me why you're running, tell me what, you, what are you going to do to make our uh, community a little bit better, that kind of thing. So um, I think that kind of stuff makes a difference. I'm not a huge fan of yard signs, but it's kind of unavoidable because if you're the campaign that doesn't use yard signs and everybody's like, I want a yard sign, where's your yard signs? You're going to lose because you don't have enough yard signs. Nobody ever got elected solely on the basis of yard signs, but it's kind of a thing that people need to have. Um, I'm not a big fan of, uh, of billboards. Um, I think that a lot of candidates use billboards because their ego tells them that they want to see a 15-foot tall version of themselves while they're driving to work. Uh, and so they can, but you know, there's someone listening to this is a billboard salesman that's like cursing my existence right now. <laughs> so, you know, maybe in some campaigns they do work. I think what billboards tend to do is reinforce to your supporters that you're running a big campaign. Like people that are already for me see my billboard and they're like, that's the guy I'm voting for. I'm excited. But it doesn't persuade people. I don't think people change their votes based on, based on billboards. But ultimately, the most important thing is that you target the voters that actually uh, need to get your message. And so if you're a Republican running for office, you probably don't need to knock on the doors or mail to the households that always vote for Republicans. Uh, you also probably don't need to waste your time knocking on the doors or mailing to the households that always vote Democrat, Democratic. You want to target those people that are gettable. You want to target the, the swing voter and spend your time on that because the, the, you know, the, scarce, the scarcity of time is, is the most sort of valuable thing that any of us have. Can I just jump in here? Uh, it's interesting because in some communities there is a culture of you got to have billboards. Like for instance, in North Canton, Ohio, uh, not only do you have to have some billboards and yard signs, you got to put your face on there. Uh, yeah. It's really kind of interesting. Whereas in some communities, you, you should you should not ever put your face. Yeah. And, and so it, it's kind of community specific, which is kind of interesting. I don't know if you've ever noticed that driving through North Canton. But when you ran for school board, did you put your face on your billboard? I did not. I, I'm from Green. Oh. Okay. So uh, and I definitely wouldn't want to put this face <laughs> on the billboard. <laughs> Because I would have lost a lot of votes. Uh, let me put on my professor hat, though, and also uh, jump in on this uh, topic, and that is the best way uh, to get involved in politics and become a candidate yourself is to work on campaigns and to work on as many campaigns as you can to meet people. You not just work on campaigns, but work hard and establish a reputation of being a good, hard worker, a smart person, and somebody that um, you know is dependable. Uh, and to build up your network, keep in touch with that network. Uh, some of our uh, most successful uh, candidates and elected officials in this country started out as unpaid volunteers uh, on, on campaigns. Absolutely. Uh, Governor John Kasich used to be uh, a staffer. Go Governor John Kasich used to be a, uh, a staffer on, on Capitol Hill. Um, the person that succeeded him used to be John Kasich's uh, staffer when, when he At was At Tiberi, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is... This is how you do it. You start from the bottom up. A lot of people think you know you can you can do it the Trump way, right? And have all this one energy. in a million. And exactly. It's, yeah. It is extremely rare. Or if you're a celebrity, yeah. and you have all that name recognition built in. But the way that most people get there is by working hard, volunteering for candidates that you believe in, establishing that network, and then honestly, politics is one area where you can advance very quickly mm -hmm. if you're good at what you do. If you're a nice person. If you have a big network. It is very possible as a young person to be at the highest levels of campaigns, at the highest levels of uh, staff, and, and even uh, being the elected official yourself uh, if you work hard and you're willing to put in the hours. And you cannot expect uh, you know, a lot of pay. This is working for what you believe in and, and the passion. But that's, that's how you got to do it. And, and, and it is very attainable. Also, 
don't expect a lot of sleep if you do it right. Campaigns are kind of late night, early morning endeavors, but show up. I mean, the message is there's great upward mobility in, in, in politics. If you're interested, if you believe in a candidate, if there, uh, and, and again, whatever party you're, you, you identify with, if you believe in a candidate, go show up at the campaign headquarters and ask them how you can help. You'll be shocked how quick they will integrate you into the team and put you to work. And before you know it, you'll be playing a pivotal role in the campaign as long as you're honest and hardworking and trustworthy. Absolutely. That's a really insightful question, and maybe I'm being a little idealistic, um, and maybe I want to stay that way. Um, you know, I, I guess I believe in this exercise in democracy, where a candidate comes out and presents their ideas and is selected for the job based on that. Does everyone take it as seriously as I do? No, unfortunately not. Uh, I wish they would. Uh, I'm going to raise my daughters to take it seriously, to do their own homework, and to actually pay attention to what the candidates have to say. But you're right, some people are looking for entertainment. Some people are looking for 30 second sound bites. Some people are very academically lazy when it comes to the decisions they make on, on, on presidential campaigns. Um, and, uh, you know, we ultimately get the democracy we deserve. You know, I do think it's a job interview, but let me just agree slightly in, in that I think people are less focused on the policy message and their position. And I think people are measuring what kind of person, what kind of character mm. uh, do they have. And, and am I comfortable with this person in the office? I think at the presidential level, I think that is especially the case. I think uh, it is less about what exactly policy, or what, what policy positions each of these candidates have, and, and it's more focused on what kind of character do they have. Am I comfortable with this person? Is this person mm -hmm. qualified for the Oval Office? Um, is this person trustworthy? And I think, uh, you know, that for 2016, especially some of these elements are, are in, especially important uh, because we have, uh, you know, an unconventional candidate uh, on the one side and then a candidate uh, that has a, uh, a pretty um, long and deep history with the American public on the other side. And I, and I think people are measuring more their character and more their fitness for the office and less about some of the policy prescriptions they're making. I would agree with you on that, and, and as important as it is to look at the issues, the campaigns expose the raw elements here. I mean, you know, it's a crucible. Having traveled with and been involved in, in all of the campaigns going back for the last decade, um, it's a physical contest. It's a mental contest. It wears you down. These people, um, you know, uh, you, you sort of find out what they're made of in some ways. As much as the campaigns try to polish it and keep it... Uh, uh, keep it sort of produced for television, you end up seeing the raw, real thing in those unguarded moments. And that's the thing that, 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 that is good that the American people sort of watch for. Uh, what is this person going to say when they think the mics are turned off? Those are great moments. <laughs> and thank God, thank God that we've got a uh, actively engaged press corps. And I don't like it when candidates uh, diminish the, 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 the role of the free press. Uh, you know, and again, does the media get it right all the time? No, but these are dedicated people that are trying to cover a story, and do they have their own biases? For sure, but it's our job to sort that out, not theirs. Uh, you know, we, uh, we we rely on a free press to kind of show us those unguarded moments. Absolutely. Ian, you have think in this race, I think it's maybe the dice cast, um, unfortunately. And, and you know something about me, that this is something I'm very passionate about, trying to return civility to our public discourse. And as I've often said, it's not just about being nice to each other. Um, that's a side benefit. We all want to be in a work environment where people are nice to each other. It's just more pleasant to go to work every day. And it also, but it, that's not what it's about. It's about better public policy. 
we can work better together when we're actually listening to each other. You know, everybody's mom told them you've got one mouth and two ears, right? I think most of us have heard that from our moms or parents or grandparents or somebody else. So that, you know, you should listen more than you talk. It's the same thing in politics. We can learn and, and, and solve problems together if we're actually listening to each other. But the problem is when we're being uncivil, when we're, when we're casting people aside because, of their, uh, because they're from a different party than me or whatever else, we're not actually engaging in a conversation that we need to engage in to solve problems. So it's not about just being nicer to each other. It's about doing better work for the people we serve in government. Uh, but it's also not the same thing as political correctness. People confuse civility with political correctness, and they should not. You don't have to be, uh, you don't have to have some sort of poll tested, uh, uh, um, you know, style of speaking. You can speak bluntly and still be respectful of the other person's opinion. Uh, you can you can deeply believe in in, in very conservative or very liberal views. Um, and still be civil to someone who has different beliefs. And that's, that, to me, is kind of a lost art, and, and we, the people, need to insist on getting that back. Yeah. And, and I would like to add on that, the important thing is to not be demonized the opposition. Hmm. You know, we need to, at the grassroots level, realize that people we disagree with as president um, are hmm. still good people. Um, that's, that's very important. And, yeah. and we're in this. We are passionate about public service because we are dedicated to what we do. We care about our community, and it, it might be that we disagree on, the, on what is best, the best policy to get there, but that is not to disparage somebody else's dedication to want to improve you know, how, how we govern. Well, but if you have, I can't think of a better place to wrap this up uh, than a discussion of our country doing. So I want to thank Senator LaRose for coming in. Thank you, really sir. Thank you. Great use of three and a half inch. You can't take a measurement. That's not yeah. determined. Okay. I still have that.